Welcome to the museum at FIT's Fashion Culture Program. You have a really fantastic um, program tonight. The Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, uh, Robin Givan, is going to be here in conversation with our own Patricia Mears to discuss Robin's new book, The Battle of Versailles, which is about a really fascinating moment in fashion history, which they will elucidate for you. So please join me in welcoming Robin and Patricia. I can't tell you how fascinating this book is. I got a chance to read it. As soon as I received it, about, oh, I think 28 hours later, it was finished. <laughs> um, and one of the things I want to say before we launch in is that it's a very unusual book in that you get several important elements in it. You usually don't do that. Usually it's a crime novel or a drama or a history book or something. This one is sort of all of those. Um, Robin, as you know, won her Pulitzer Prize in part because she is so analytical. She really understands the political environment. She really understands history. And so she's sort of really giving you background as to why this event, this night at Versailles in 1973, was so important. But it also then quickly turns into a kind of soap opera. It reminds me a little bit of <laughs> Dallas and a cross between the Real Housewives. Um, <laughs> and then it turns into an incredible, poignant story about some of the key people that I hope to discuss with uh, us a little bit tonight. Oh, I've, let me get this. I think we might as well have Robin just go ahead and start for us. Well, I want to just give you a little bit of background. Thank you for coming, first of all. And um, pardon me if I'm like really nervous. Um, it's just, I'm just a nervous person. Um, but the story of Versailles was one that I had heard bits and pieces about over the years as I was reporting other stories. And it was essentially a 1973 French-American fashion show that was held as a fundraiser for Versailles, which had a leaky roof, it had rats, it was not the place that we know it today. And at the time, the idea was really sparked by a woman named Eleanor Lambert, who was a publicist, and who had in many ways been sort of setting the stage for this moment. Uh, she was prepared when the opportunity presented itself. And she believed in American fashion in a way that few others did. She really believed that it should not only share the stage internationally, but she believed that it should also be discussed in the same sentences as the visual arts and as film and as music. She believed that it reflected our culture. And she wanted to give American designers an opportunity to be seen and heard on the world stage. And when the Versailles curator mentioned to her, and he was a friend of hers, that he was looking for a way to raise money uh, for the, the palace, she's had an aha moment and she said, well, the only thing I could really think of is to put on a show. And he thought that was a spectacular idea because a lot of the funding for Versailles had come from wealthy Americans. And as it happened, uh, Eleanor, being the savvy publicist that she was, the five American designers who were invited to participate were ultimately her clients. And the Americans who participated were Bill Blass and Oscar de la Renta, who were her longtime clients, uh, Anne Klein, uh, Halston, and Stephen Burroughs. It was a very eclectic mix of American designers. And on the French side, it was five guys you probably have never heard of. Yves Saint Laurent, Hubert de Givenchy, Pierre Cardin, uh, Emmanuel Ungaro and Marc Bohan, who was the designer of Christian Dior at the time. 
I think one of the things that is really fun as Robin starts this is, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the designers in a minute, but it's also the people behind the event. Uh, one key person, especially the lady you see here in lime green, Marie-Hélène de Rothschild. Um, Robin, what was her role and, and why was she important in bringing all these people together? Well, I'm just going to apologize as I mutilate any French names. Uh, one of the things that I learned as I was reporting this book is that my college French was not nearly as good as I thought it was. And there was a particular moment when I was so excited that I had gotten a contact number for Marc Bohan that I like, you know, grabbed the phone and immediately called him in the French countryside. And about a week later, I hired someone who was fluent in French to do some research for me, and I said, the first thing that you need to do is call Mark Bohan and apologize for the crazy American lady who tried to speak French to him and drove him crazy. So it was miraculous that he would even speak to me after that. Anyway, Marie Helene was uh, sort of the socialite beyond all socialites. And she had thrown these spectacular parties in the past, one of which was her famous Proust Ball, which involved Cecil Beaton taking photographs of guests in costume as they arrived. So she was known as an extraordinary hostess. When she died, her obituary talked about her reign as, this, as the, the most uh, renowned hostess of her era. And what it meant was that she had extraordinary social clout, she had connections uh, both in the design world and also politically. And what uh, Eleanor Lambert and the curator of Versailles realized was that in order to make this a, as massive a happening, to draw the kind of guests that they needed in order to raise close to a quarter million dollars, they needed someone who had those kinds of connections, whose very name attached to the event would make people sit up and take notice. And this was a crowd that globetrotted. So they were competing with many other shiny balls out there on the social swirl. And Marie Helene was really able to capture them and also exude a certain amount of pressure on the kind of clothes that the French designers ultimately showed. She was a couture customer. They all were. I think one of the th reasons I put a couple of these images up is, Robin, it sounded like initially the press wasn't really paying that much attention to the fact that it was a fashion show. They didn't really care, but they really wanted to know what these people were going to be wearing. It was sort of like who could out glitter whom. Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing was that the fashion press, meaning Women's Wear Daily, was very focused on the designers. But the mainstream press, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Sun-Times, they were really more focused on this as a social event. They cared because it was obviously Versailles, but because of the names that were associated, women like C.Z. Guest and Marie-Hélène de Rothschild, um, the, the Duchess of Windsor, I mean, on and on it sort of went. And so the thing that really struck me was when I was looking through the clips, I was looking through New York Times clips, and the story was not written by the fashion critic. It was written by a feature writer and a society writer who was sent to capture the scene and not necessarily the clothes. One of the things that I really loved was Robin's ability to capture the moment. And I think there were two things that really struck me. One is how in awe people were when the, the American team arrived at Versailles. It was really eye-popping. This place was really covered in gold. The chandeliers were beautiful. And the stage apparently was enormous. Um, and I think the evening of, um, a number of the designers had yeah. boxes and they were able to lure in some pretty high profile people. And the crazy thing was that the designers were not allowed to work the backstage. They were invited to sit in the box and their assistants could work backstage and make sure that everything was unfolding the way that they wanted it to. And this, this theater was 
breathtaking. I mean, one of the things that several of the models talked about were these sort of marble walls. And the walls actually were not marble, marble they were wood, um, with a trompe l'oeil effect. Um, but the chandeliers were gilded, and it was a, a traditional proscenium stage. And the wings were soared, I mean, like 40 feet high. So trying to put on a fashion show under those circumstances was daunting even for the French who created incredibly elaborate sets and had clothing that was very much meant to, or I should say productions that were very much meant to evoke something out of Marie Antoinette, uh, it's Marie Antoinette's time period. The Americans you know, their clothes were, it was sportswear. It was quite simple. Um, their set was very simple. Their music was pre-recorded. They did not have a full orchestra the way that the French did. And they were really relying on Broadway-style choreography as conceived by Kay Thompson. And they were relying on the stage presence of their models to really project all the way back to, I was gonna say the cheap seats, but there were no cheap seats, uh, all the way back to the, the upper reaches of the theater. We're gonna look through a few of these things. I think one of the things that Robin details so beautifully is how different not only the presentations were between the French, their presentation of the five designers took about two hours or something like that, and the Americans took yeah. a fifth of that time. Um, but it, the sets got crazy. I think this is um, Emmanuel Ngaro. You can't see it very well, but in the background, there's a huge painted rhinoceros pulling a gypsy caravan, and Jane Birkin is on the stage. What this has to do with... And she's her, wearing panties, really. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and and uh, even at that time, Ngaro was, you know, kind of a hip designer in the 60s. I, I simply don't understand what this was about. I mean, many of the, the descriptions of the French w were basically just perplexed. No one quite understood what Louis Jordan and Jane Birkin were doing. Louis Jordan was wearing these sort of ears or horns, and no one could figure out whether or not he was supposed to be a rhinoceros or what was going on. Um, the, the Saint Laurent set involved... Um, uh, 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 an antique car, and I should say, the French kept referring to them as floats, and what they really were, were these sets sort of constructed out of something like foam core, and each one was distinctive to the designer, but there was no through line, you know, what, designer A was not connected to designer B at all, they were very distinct, and interspersed in there, there was a pas de deux with Rudolf Nureyev, there was some poetry being read, there were some songs, there, I mean, it was just sort of all over the place. And I love, there were drag queens carting around uh, a performer during the Saint Laurent portion. Uh, there was a giant flower basket at Givenchy. There was a rocket for Pierre Cardin, uh, which women's wear described as sort of thrust for takeoff, um, because there was a man. And it was, it was insane. And I had the great um, uh, uh, experience of interviewing Pierre Berger, who was Saint Laurent's partner, and who was there at the time. And you know, he described it, watching this unfold, and just thinking that it was a disaster because nothing was connected, and it just went on forever. And one of the things that the Americans talked about, uh, you know, they took everything so personally and they felt that the French were just out to get them and they were making things as difficult as possible. But in conversations with those who were on the French side, there, there was, it was more like benign neglect. The French were not aggressively attempting to make life difficult for the Americans. They had just created a giant disaster for themselves. And they were trying to make sure that you know, they could dig their way out of it. So they rehearsed first. And they took up a lot of time because they had just incredible numbers of moving parts to try and connect, which they never quite did. Right. And I, I did see some of the photos of Rudolf Nureyev dancing in Sleeping Beauty, and you just didn't understand how any of it went together. But I think the thing that struck me at the end, Robin, and you really captured that as well, 
was the feeling is the French were almost relieved. Oh my God, this thing is over. We're half time now. <laughs> and I think the Americans felt we can't do worse than this. And yet they did feel this way. Now, first of all, they were infighting. But before we do move to that, I just want to mention very briefly, the one high point for them was the American performer, Josephine Baker, yeah. who comes out and sings My Two Loves, basically the country meaning France and Paris. And I just want to point out that at this point, Josephine Baker is in her 70s. And she's looking pretty spectacular. Uh, she's basically naked, except for some sequins. And, you know, she was incredibly gracious to the American models who were in complete awe of her. I mean, there were descriptions of, you know, some of them spotting her during the rehearsal and just kind of bursting into tears because they knew what she had been through. They understood her role in the civil rights movement. They knew that she had embraced, that she had been embraced by France and she had in, in, had in return embraced France because it had given her a kind of freedom that she didn't have in the States. And on some level, the young models, even in the early 70s, related to that because they felt that they had to be twice as good to get half as far. And they were enthralled with her. And Oscar de la Renta, uh, who did not know her, uh, but basically just introduced himself and said he's, there were these, you know, 10 or 11 black models who were absolutely captivated by her and could he, would she come to lunch with them? And she said yes. And one of the models, a woman named Amina, uh, had said to me that having lunch with Josephine Baker was the absolute high point of the entire experience for her. And keep in mind, I think what was so extraordinary, we're going to turn to the Americans now, because they did have a lot of problems. They were fighting amongst themselves. Halston was behaving particularly badly. He was referring to himself in a um, third Macon person. Mentioned. Yes, he did. <laughs> Sulking and carrying on. But there were some technical problems, too. Um, Joe Eula had done the sets, and from the way Robin described them, they were way too small when they got there. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there was some miscommunication about feet versus meters. And uh, so the sets were too small, and so they punted. And you know, Joe Eula did one sketch of the Eiffel Tower in his very distinctive spare brushstroke style, and that was the background. And the original plan had always been to use relatively simple sets and to allow the lighting to really create drama. And the idea was to use a kind of chiaroscuro effect with the lighting. They also had used, had decided on using pre-recorded music. Um, they were on a budget, which also ex explains to some degree their choice of models. But um, in using the pre-recorded music, I was really amazed that they had recorded it all in one seamless recording, including blank spots for when there would be a transition on the stage so that if a transition was five or 10 seconds too slow or too fast, they would be out of sync with the music, which just seemed like insanity to me. Um, and the wonderful sound technician who had worked, was working with Liza Minnelli, had noted that the only real instruction that he got from the designers was that they wanted the music really, really, really loud. <laughs> You know, they wanted to evoke kind of a nightclub atmosphere. And that was part of their, that was part of what they brought to the, to the production. I think one of the things that really made it for the Americans, and I'm going to use the word sort of, the whole event was really a woman's event. We've seen people like Eleanor Lambert, Mary Lind Rothschild, and now we're seeing Liza Minnelli on stage, and she mentioned Kate Thompson, who was the sort of choreographer director. But the special women were the young African-American models. The Americans, Robin made a point of getting the models on the cheap. They were not hiring the top names. They got a wide range of ethnic backgrounds, but they got 10 spectacular young African-American women. And really, everybody, the designers, the audience, and even historians today really say they were the ones who made the show. Because the clothes were the clothes. Yeah. You know, the 
Someone asked me if, if I thought that the Americans really showed up the French in terms of design, and they didn't. You know, the reality is that many of the, the American clothes were spare, they were simple. Um, Anne Klein, who, you know, was battling the cancer that would eventually kill her only a few months after Versailles, um, you know, was not even wanted at this event because the French thought that her clothes were too simple. They were, t they were, it was just sportswear. And even her American colleagues weren't thrilled to have her there because she did sportswear. And what I thought was particularly uh, just in interesting about her work was that it wasn't just sportswear, it was because that's what Stephen Burroughs was doing. That's what Halston was doing. She was doing sportswear that was really about daytime apparel. It was what women who are going out into the workforce, who are establishing careers and not just getting jobs. It was clothing that was aimed at them. It was focused on separates to make their lives easier, to make the clothes more adaptable to their daily activities. She engaged in a little bit of vanity sizing, which was putting a size six on a dress that really fit more like a size 10, God bless her. <laughs> you know, she was really tapped into that sort of rising tide of feminism. And, you know, someone asked me why Eleanor Lambert fought so hard for uh, Anne Klein to be part of Versailles. And my own, this is my own sort of reading between the lines, but I really got the impression that Eleanor Lambert knew what it was to be a working woman who had made her own way, who had created a career for herself. And I think it was important to her that there be a woman represented on stage at Versailles. And I think that she had a long-standing relationship with Anne Klein and that it was important to her that it be a woman who was entrepreneurial, who was a real sort of garment industry kind of woman. I think, Robin, one of the things that struck everybody, too, is how financially successful she was. She had a very big business, uh, much more financially successful than most of the other men, and only one woman out of ten designers represented. Um, but I do think what touched me also was how, as you said, strong she was. She knew her breast cancer had come back. She was going to be dying and did so relatively shortly afterwards. And it was also some lovely words from Donna Karen, who was there at that time, standing yeah. behind the scenes. Donna was, uh, was Anne Klein's assistant at the time. She was very pregnant when she was there. Uh, and when they came back from Versailles, you know, Donna tells, told me this just incredible story that sort of unfolded like, you know, a scene from a film because in one hospital, Donna is giving birth and in another, Anne is, you know, taking her last breaths. And essentially, Donna, you know, receives a phone call and she thinks that it's, you know, a, someone calling to tell her that, oh, you know, we want to come over and see the baby. And in fact, they're calling to tell her that Anne Klein has passed away and that she now has to step up and become, take over the collection and prepare um, for the unveiling of it. And, you know, the last time that Donna saw Anne Klein alive really was at Versailles when she, you know, saw that she was being sort of poorly treated by her colleagues, but also watched as Anne really just put her nose to the grindstone and just, you know, got through it and focused and worked through it and pulled off a very successful presentation. And even to, to this day, you know, Donna talks about how everything she learned about fashion, she really learned from Anne Klein. And I think before we move on to the next designer, I wanted to make a point that this was an African-inspired collection, and she actually talked to some of the models. How did they feel yeah. about wearing these clothes, and what was their response? Yeah, she talked uh, to, to Beth Ann Hardison about the collection, and, uh, you know, and, and Beth Ann had said to her, you know, it makes sense what you're doing. It makes sense that you're using, the, using black models. And you know, Beth Ann was sort of the, the odd duck out 
uh, in, in many ways, something that she says herself, because she was not just modeling, she was also working as Stephen Burroughs' fit model. She had a son. Modeling was sort of not her full-time gig. But for a lot of the, the women, the black models in particular, who are on the runway, this pro provided an opportunity, opportunity for them to really escape sort of mundane jobs. It gave them a chance to travel. But I think it also spoke to them in a very um, visceral way because it allowed them to step into the spotlight and to be celebrated for essentially being themselves. And it allowed them a certain a kind of freedom that many women were experiencing at that time because of the clothes, clothes that were less about constraining a woman and more about setting her free. And I think that um, I think that aspect of the clothes spoke particularly um, uh, to the the black models. But I, I should also say that you know there were 36 models that the Americans brought. Ten of them were black. The rest were a mix of many different ethnicities. And the one through line was that all of the models were encouraged to bring their personality to run to the runway, to express themselves, to be free. And the black models led the way but they encouraged their colleagues and inspired their colleagues. And so all of them uh, moved in a way that was even more so what they had been doing in the States. And it was very different from the French, the way Robin described them. They were very formal, a little haughty, and very boring. There, there was a great comment by one of the French models who said that, you know, that she was out on the runway and it was, you know, during the Emmanuel Ungaro portion and she said, no, I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I was just sort of standing there and it was sort of awkward. Well, Jane Birkin runs around in her little white <laughs> panties. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting is we're going to move on to the men's personalities because while the women were ladies and strong, the men were not so they weren't really gentlemen. Um, one of the better acting ones, I think, was Bill Blass of the older guard. He seemed to be less contentious, maybe. You know, Bill was, um, Bill had kind of seen it all. You know, he'd been in the business for a while. He had, he was establishing his brand. He understood the ways of this high social swirl. And in, and I think also to some degree, he kind of knew that Oscar de la Renta was going to sort of do his dirty work. And we'll see in a minute how he did that. <laughs> I think the sweetheart of the group, though, was Stephen Burroughs. Stephen was the last of the American designers to become uh, Eleanor, Lambert's, Eleanor Lambert's client. And he kind of came out of nowhere and surprised her. Um, he had not gone through sort of the usual route of spending time working for a manufacturer, spending significant time working for a manufacturer. He had, after uh, going to FIT, he and his friend uh, and an investor established O Boutique downtown, and it was this kind of headquarters of cool fashion and art and music and just cool place to hang out. And he was discovered by um, you know, various editors and he was out dancing, which was his favorite activity. And his friends would come over and they would all sort of get dressed from his pile of clothes, both the men and the women all pulling from the same pile of clothes. And you could see in his style that so much of his work looked would look its best if you were spinning and if you were had a dancer's body and if you were a little bit sweaty and you were just having a time at a dance club. And he you know, won a Cody Award. He had this spectacular display at the Cody Awards. And Eleanor Lambert was like, I got to have this kid. And he was, in fact, a kid. He was by far the youngest designer. And she wanted him because he had buzz. And, you know, while all while the other designers had sort of labored under or, or in the shadow of Paris, Stephen Burroughs did not have that kind of 
weight on his shoulders. He didn't have those issues with Paris. He thought it would be fun. And in my interviews with him, he was so uncomplicated in his decision to go to Versailles. He just thought it would be fun. And Robin has a great story also that he didn't bother to tell his mother. <laughs> his mother, you know, originally he was studying to be an art teacher and then he sort of moved into fashion which did not exactly thrill his mother. But then his clothes were picked up at Henry Bendall and his mother was thrilled. And after Versailles and after the success there and just the experience of having his clothes on the runway and having Saint Laurent tell him that he thought he was masterful and incredibly talented, he came back and he didn't tell any of this to his mother. He didn't tell the story and I was like, well, why wouldn't you tell your mother? And he said it's because, well, she really wouldn't understand what it all meant. And I thought, well, you could have explained it to her. But, you know, in his mind, it was, it was a moment, but it wasn't, you know, it, it, he, he's not, he, he wasn't ready to sort of analyze it and think about what it might have meant beyond that. And I think his assessment of Versailles was also very much reflected in the kinds of clothes that he created. They were clothes that had this kind of joyful release and freedom, and they were meant to be worn by those who were celebrating a moment. Well, while Stephen was the love of the group, quietly working away happily, Anne Klein was in the back crying, being comforted by Donna, <laughs> and Bill Blass was sort of sauntering around, we had Halston. Yes. We had Halston, who referred to himself as Halston. And, you know, he, he was difficult, he was demanding, he was very stressed. And in his defense, he had just made a huge business deal with Norton Simon. He was a freshly minted millionaire. And many of the stories about what was happening in Paris really set it up as a kind of Halston extravaganza. And he was under tremendous pressure. The other piece of it was that it was his relationship with Liza Minnelli that had uh, attracted her to the presentation. And as things began to get a little rocky during the rehearsals, as you know, the sets aren't quite working and other, other incidents keep coming up, Halston is starting to really worry that he's essentially sucked his good friend, Liza Minnelli, fresh off an Oscar win, into a disaster. And so I think that all of those things combined with his own predilection for being able to be his best marketer resulted in his being a bit of a pain in the tush. Um, we're gonna talk about Liza again in a second. Um, but I think what's very funny is that uh, Oscar de Laurenta played a number two. One of the big issues I think that these designers, the Americans especially, were concerned with was what order they were going to go in, who went first and who went last. And originally it sounded like Halston was gonna go last, but Oscar wound up doing it. Well, Oscar had had a conversation with Bill Blass. They worked in the same building and they were headed over to one of the last meetings about Versailles. And one of the things that Oscar did not want to have happen was for Halston to get the finale. And there was a little bit of backstory here because originally when Halston invited Liza Minnelli to perform, he was being very secretive about it. And it was because the plan was that Liza Minnelli was going to perform in Halston's segment, and only Halston's segment. And Oscar was having none of it. And so Oscar decided, well, I'm gonna call Raquel Welch, who you know, was doing Three Musketeers or something, and see if she'll be in my portion of the show. And so he calls up, up uh, Raquel and explains the situation. And then Liza gets wind of this and essentially says, well, great, so I'm gonna be singing and dancing my heart out, and then Raquel is gonna come out and essentially just be Raquel. <laughs> and no one's gonna remember that I was even on the stage. 
so after some back and forth with this, uh, the, the designers agree, okay, it'll just be Liza, but Liza will be kind of the thread that ties everything together. And she would perform in the opening and the closing, and she would be the only star who was involved. However, Oscar was still not done with Halston. <laughs> so they're all going over to the last, one of the last meetings, and at this meeting, they're going to decide the order. And Oscar knows that he can't really suggest that they go in alphabetical order, because that will mean that he'll go last, and Halston, he assumes, will pitch a fit. So he decides that the best thing to do would be to essentially let Kay Thompson make the decision, because that way, um, you know, no one can argue. And, or actually, I think I have this backwards, my own recollections, as fuzzy as some of the people I interviewed, that he wants to like, he wants to go in alphabetical order. But instead, he gets there and they've agreed that they're going to do alphabetical order. But then Kay Thompson says, well, you know, I can pick the order and I think that what should happen is that Anne Klein should go first and then Stephen Burroughs and then, you know, Bill Blass, and then I think, you know, Halston, Oscar should go next, and then Halston. And she says she thinks Halston should go last because Halston does so much evening wear. And before Oscar can complain, Bill Blass says, that sounds great. <laughs> and he had made a pact with Oscar, we're not gonna let Halston get away with it. So they all walk out, and Oscar, of course, turns to Bill and essentially says, And Oscar's not done. So he goes home and he is charged with sending over to Paris the final list of the order of show. And he gives them the list, he gives them the order, and the order is Anne Klein, and it's Bill Blass, and it's Stephen Burroughs, and it's Halston, and it's Oscar de la Renta. <laughs> And he says, and if Halston has a problem with it, tell him to call me. And he is fully prepped for a big, you know, knockdown, drag out, and Halston never calls. That's right. So Oscar gets the finale slot. Exactly, exactly. And Oscar told me this story, so he's totally good with it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where it really becomes, I mean, it's sort of the real housewives, but with, with designers. Um, one of the things that... Robin brought up was the idea of using certain celebrity clients. You notice with um, some of the French designers, we had Gigi Jean-Marie, and we know, noted Jane Birkin, and then Capucine, they were all in the French sections, and the Americans were gonna follow suit. Well, Liza, of course, steps in, and she does actually the opening number, where all the Americans are represented. They come out, they do a rousing. Mm -hmm. And she turns out to be quite the wonderful person in this. And one of Halston's initial ideas was to have Marissa Berenson, but she was meh. You know, it, for yeah, all the celebrities, she know, wasn't all that... All one that. of the things that the, the Americans did manage to agree on because they didn't have a lot of money was that they would pool their resources to pay for the models. The result was that three designers had to agree to use a model, and if so, then her fee could be paid from the kitty. That didn't mean that a designer couldn't decide that they want to bring a special model and just pay for her trip himself, and that's what Halston did. He decided that he wanted to bring uh, many of his celebrity friends, uh, like Marissa Berenson, who was in fact uh, a, a model, and Elsa Peretti, and Jane Holzer, and people like that. And part of the problem was that while these were known women within a certain orbit, for the French on stage, many of them didn't register but even more so than not particularly registering in the way that Halston sort of imagined that they would, was that they paled in comparison to the models, and particularly to the black models, several of whom had come out of the Ebony Fashion Fair tradition that was less about fashion and more about entertainment and more about sort of uplifting the race and self-esteem and dazzlement. 
And so that was how they had really learned how to present themselves on the runway. And in New York at the time, many designers who were hiring them were encouraging them to bring that same kind of effervescence to their runway performances. And it was also, it matched the clothes. I mean, if you walked out in a Stephen Burroughs jersey dress, sedately, it didn't look all that exciting because there wasn't, it wasn't so structured that the dress itself sort of stood at attention when it walked out. It really needed the woman to bring it to life. Um, we talked a little bit about Liza. She seemed to be quite the trooper and professional and getting everybody motivated, but she even rode in the bus with some of them yeah. because the models were not staying in the same nice hotels as the designers. They were the quite models weren't even in Paris. The yeah. models were like out, in, the models were in the equivalent of like a comfort inn. <laughs> and had to be bussed in. And also it seems like Versailles was kind of a cold, drafty place. They weren't getting fed on time and they were being standing around for hours. So they really, all of them yeah. were troopers. But I think some of the descriptions of a few of them, like the beloved Pat Cleveland, who's just the loveliest person, but Pat would, you said she would start twirling, 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 twirling. <laughs> but she would stop. She wouldn't quite go over the edge of the stage. She would, one of the, one of the great models, Karen Bjornsson was describing watching Pat Cleveland sort of prepare to go on stage, to, to go out onto the runway, uh, and just watching Pat essentially like revving up like a top backstage. I mean, she would be spinning before she actually appeared on stage <laughs> and would just be spinning faster and faster and faster. And how she didn't get dizzy and just keel over was beyond me. And she would manage to just sort of stick her landing right there at the foot of the runway and leave people kind of awestruck. And one of the things that Pat had said was that, you know, she learned and was inspired a lot by watching uh, her on and watching the dancers in the Catherine Dunham Dance Company. Yeah. So she really was a dancer herself. I think one of the other great characters in this was Beth Ann Hardison, and she really is kind of a warrior. Um, what was Beth Ann's take on the whole thing and her subsequent experience, I guess, from it? Yeah, you know, Beth Ann worked very closely with, uh, with Stephen Burroughs and with, with several of the other designers. And, you know, for her, it was, um, you know, there was a sort of touch and go whether or not she was actually going to be able to, to be part of Versailles, to be on the runway, because she describes herself as an unusual model. You know, she had a very tomboy kind of look. She was very straight up and down. And there was some debate about whether or not an, you know, another designer, aside from Stephen Burroughs, would use her in his, in his segment. And she ended up uh, working with, um, I believe, Oscar de la Renta as well as um, Anne Klein. But you know, she later on went, oh, she has gone on to certainly be an enormous advocate uh, for greater diversity on the runway. But at the time, when she came back, you know, she knew that there had been a really great success. Um, and, you know, in many ways, I, I feel like, you know, Beth Ann has sort of picked up the mantle uh, for championing diversity after there was a very sort of low, lull, homogenizing of the runway um, beginning pretty much in the 90s. But I think of all of them, and they were all spectacular, the one that touched me the most was Billy Blair, and she seemed in so many ways the most unusual choice. I think, first of all, Robin, before we talk about Billy herself, can you describe her performance a little bit with Oscar, because she, she was in all of the American sections, but especially the Bill Blass one, because I don't think he anticipated that she was going to be yeah. such a potent force for him. Well, early, before they went to Versailles, you know, Bill Blass had finished up the collection and there was sort of his finale dress, which was this sort of gorgeous sequin jersey gown with um, matching with a coat that had sable on it. And he wanted to give it kind of a test, test run. And he'd agreed to do a charity event in Philadelphia. And so he, he dispatched his right-hand man to Philadelphia with this dress, and he gave him explicit instructions. Put it on a Grace Kelly type. And off the right hand, Tom, Tom Fallon was his, his right hand man, and off he went to Philadelphia, running late, 
gets on the train. By the time he gets to Philadelphia, uh, he realizes that almost all the models have kind of headed out to get some rest before the show. And the only one left is this skinny girl that he had bumped into on the train, one that he referred to as olive oil. She was skinny. She looked like she was about 16 years old, even though she was, in fact, older. She was wearing this sort of bright yellow chubby and these crazy earrings, and she had this goofy laugh. And they said to him, well, you know, the only model left is olive oil. <laughs> and, you know, poor Tom is thinking, oh, my God, Bill is going to murder me. But, you know, what can he do? He's, she's what's left. And so he heads out, he gets dressed for the evening, he comes back, and he's just literally thinking, just get it over with. I cannot bear to watch it. She's probably going to trip over the sable. And all of a sudden, the lights dim, and there's this figure standing on stage. Her hair is done up in these Marcel waves. She is striking these, this pose with a cigarette in a cigarette holder tilted up to the sky. And she is the most regal, haughty, aloof, fabulous model he has ever seen. And he is completely bowled over by the way that she carries herself, the way that she can just capture the room with you know, just like a gesture. And afterwards, he goes backstage to talk to Olive Oil, whose actual name is Billy Blair. And he finds this girl backstage laughing hysterically like a teenager. And he falls madly in love with her, and he gets back to New York, and Bill says to him, how did we do? And Tom says, you brought the house down, and Bill says, you found my Grace Kelly. And Tom says, well, not so much. And he explains what happened and explains, to, says to Bill, you've got to use this girl for Versailles. She's going to Versailles. And Bill is in, there are two of them are in the midst of a huge argument about this because Bill wanted his Grace Kelly type. When the phone rings, it's Oscar de la Renta. Oscar is asking Bill if he's ready for Versailles, and Oscar's bragging about how he has found the star for his segment of the show. It's this girl named Billy Blair. <laughs> and Oscar's, and Bill says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's in my segment as well. <laughs> and she was. She was the magician. And in her. Oscar's segment, she played this magician who comes out sort of weaving, you know, waving her arms in the air and pulling a different colored scarf from her hand magically. And each time she'd pull a scarf out of her hand in a different color, models would sort of emerge wearing dresses dominated by that color. And she was such, she was so captivating that uh, towards the, after the show, uh, Josephine Baker comes backstage and says, where is she? And she says this to Tom Fallon, who knows immediately who Josephine Baker is talking about. And he brings over Billy Blair. And Josephine Baker says to her, you know, I came to Paris in 1922 or whatever it was, and you came to Paris tonight. And I will tell you, you know, I'm going to hand over some questions from the audience to Robin. Um, you don't, you, we use that word awesome all the time to describe things. This book really is, and I think there is a certain sense of awe. Because I said it goes from political history to outrageous soap opera to, at the very end, a very touching story. And I think there are few people in the world that have this kind of magic. The most unexpected heroine turns out to be, in a certain way, the great star of the event. And we have Robin to thank for bringing all of this to life for us tonight. Thank you, Robin. Uh, thank you so much. She's going to answer some questions, and then the book is for sale. This is your chance to get Robin <laughs> to sign it for you. And I really encourage you. It's, it's a book for everyone. You don't have to really have that much interest in fashion to really get a lot out of it and enjoy it. Uh, one of the questions is, who is your favorite designer from the show and why? That's like a little bit like asking, who's your favorite child and why? Um, 
but I, I would say that just in terms of writing the book, um, it was probably Stephen Burroughs because he certainly, certainly he was the only one of the American designers who was still um, one of two who were still alive at the time. Oscar has since passed away. Um, and I think Oscar de la Renta, his career trajectory, the trajectory of his company was as one might have expected it to be. You know, I mean, it, it became a very successful company and one of uh, Oscar's great skills was his ability to continue to celebrate his loyal customers and also bring in new customers as diverse as, you know, Sarah Jessica Parker and Nicki Minaj. So I, th I think that was almost um, kind of the expected end to the story. I was fascinated by Stephen Burrow's story because he was such a dazzling character at Versailles and during that time period. And in so many ways, he reflected what was happening in the 1970s. He reflected, his work reflected the newfound sense of freedom. It reflected a greater diversity it, that came out of the racial turmoil of the 1960s, the issues raised by the Kerner Report. He spoke to the transition of fashion from something that was dictated in the atelier to something that came from the street, that came from popular culture. And he's also just a very unique personality because he was someone who uh, very much lived in the moment. And I think his career has had a very sort of roller coaster feel to it since then. Um, but I also think that his work uh, has been incredibly influential and you see it reflected in collections like Marc Jacobs and Anna Sui and, and others. So I think he's, he was most interesting to me because his career took such unusual and surprising turns and still you could see the impact that he had in a broader way. Um, will it will it be possible to create a similar show nowadays with young designers and plus size transgender models? I started, turned it over to see who all like and um, I, I think it would be fun to try. But one of the things that was so distinctive about Versailles was that the fashion world seemed to be so discreetly divided between Paris and everyone else. And in particular, um, you know, there's the, the great sort of exhibition here that talks about faking it and copies and knockoffs. And one of the things that was so prevalent and so uh, powerful before Versailles was Paris's dominance on creativity and the way that creativity trickled down and across from Paris. And knocking off was a very organized and structured uh, thing that put money into the coffers of Parisian designers. And today, I don't think there's that, there's not that distinctive line anymore. I mean, who's to say what is a French design house when a house might be based in Paris and the creative director is German or Belgian or Italian and the customer base is overwhelmingly American or South American. I mean, it's, it's very hard to draw those distinct lines, but I do think it would be interesting to have a kind of fashion show where you saw many different kinds of designers with different po whose points of view represented different touchstones in popular culture. Um, just sort of see how they play off of one another and how one inspires the other. And as for the models, you know, one of the one of the sad things for me about the Versailles reporting was that, you know, there was a, the, the 
Versailles models sort of came back into conversation at a time when there was very little diversity on the runways. And they were looked at as this shining moment when there was this incredible amount of diversity and they were celebrated. And I think that there was this great desire to see that they had opened a door and that that door had remained open. And I don't know, I would say that they opened the door and the door remains cracked, but I don't think it's open as wide as it once was. And some of that, I believe, comes from the fact that in the 70s, so many of the designers were asking for models to bring their personality and their individuality to the runway. And that's what those black models did. And they did so because their beauty wasn't enough. I mean, the fundamental reality was that they were not considered the standard of beauty. And in order for them to make head, headway, they had to bring something more to the table. You know, they had to bring personality, they had to bring a dynamic presence, they had to bring the ability to spin like a top. And when that was celebrated and when that was valued, it allowed for more diversity. And I think we moved into a period when designers wanted less personality and they wanted more just sort of standardized, standard, quiet beauty and presence. And when that happened, I think sort of diversity of all sorts became less valued. Um, so perhaps there will come another period when we want more personality on the runway and I think that door will open up and there will be greater diversity of all kinds on the runway. Let's hope. Um, how about one more because I know book signing should begin soon. Oh, how much money did this raise and have there been subsequent competitions like this? Um, my recollection is that the event raised approximately $250,000 in today's dollars. Uh, and uh, no, there hasn't been another event like this, although certainly there have been international shows where, for instance, Halston you know, went to China. Uh, there was uh, an, a show in Japan. So there definitely were shows where American designers took their work on the road and showed it to an international audience. And even before this, uh, there were fashion shows sponsored by the State Department uh, to um, bring American style to other parts of the world. And, you know, one of, that was one of the really wonderful revelations for me in writing about this particular show. It was learning about how in the past um, fashion, particularly in the U.S., was lumped in with the visual arts and with film and with music and as a and was kind of a creative export that was not just thought of in terms of economic clout but was also thought of in terms of something that represented us as Americans that represented American culture it represented who we are and that was really lovely to see that it was something that, as a country, we sort of got behind and celebrated. Great. Robin, thank you so much. She's going to be here. Thank you. Sign books. So. And you can ask more questions. <laughs>